we were dealing with it from several different perspectives that they had never heard before and it made them nervous and they didn't want to be the guys publishing the book that was wrong somehow and they didn't understand it so they were extra jumpy welcome back to thinking critical this is wes and uh, recently we've heard uh, rumblings that the milestone relaunch which was announced in 2015 then re-announced in 2017 but we haven't really seen it yet is actually getting traction and again there were some legal issues that have been put behind them and Dennis Cowan has specifically said that Milestone is about to relaunch, and they're moving forward with it. And here with me to talk about the, the relaunch, maybe some of the, the history behind Milestone, is a man that used to work there, my good friend, Jervain Dargan. How you doing? I'm doing well, Wes. How's everything with you? I'm doing pretty good. So this is pretty exciting news. Um, like I mentioned, they, they did announce in 2015 that they would be relaunching it. Then they announced in 2017, they reaffirmed that with, with the same information. But apparently there were some legal issues behind the scenes with uh, a couple of the, the creators. I believe it was uh, Dwayne McDuffie's family. I believe he's no longer yeah. with us. But also Dennis Cowan, one of the original four creators as well. Yeah, and I think um, I did a little research on it last night because I actually wasn't aware that that was the reason why the uh, Milestone Revival was being held up. But apparently, um, according to at least some articles, um, Dwayne's um, estate, his wife, and, I, and it sounded like um, from what his wife described, I think she was also um, involving her mother. Is one, his mother is one of the parties, um, owned about 50 percent of Milestone. And apparently Dennis Conway owned the other 50 percent. And um, and it turns out that when they decided to relaunch it, that at least it was, it was felt like um, the heirs of Dwayne McDuffie weren't um, either being properly involved or most likely properly being compensated um, for whatever the new deal was that was being struck up with DC. You know, those, those things take those things take time. I'm not sure um, why that was such a point of contention in terms of the agreement. Um, I think it's always been pretty clear um, who the founders were at Milestone and, and what their economic interests are. But, um, you know, I'm glad to see that they, they've worked it out and it seems that um, it's worked out to the satisfaction of all the parties involved. And um, it'll be interesting to see what they do at this point. But um, it is clearly, it's still a very beloved brand. Um, a lot of people remember it, um, especially in the, um, the black community. Um, and I count myself amongst one of them. Uh, we all love that, 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 that line when it was out and, um, and was sad to see it go when it did. So to hear that they're um, reviving it, I'm, I'm excited to see what they're going to do with it. Yeah, I'm well, we're certainly in some, uh, we're, we're in charge time. There's a lot of uh, division and everything like that. Do you think this is the right time to relaunch a milestone? Do you think it could be part of the healing process, or at least within the comic book community, and maybe talk about some of these things and, and get some open discussion out there? Honestly, I think it does have the, I think it can have the potential to do that. The, um, the only re there's probably about two reasons why I'm a little concerned that it might not happen. I think one of it is sort of the rebranding of it. So um, if I, uh, if I saw it correctly, they're actually going to be launching it kind of under this um, this brand of Earth M, which I think ties it a lot more closely into just the DC continuity in the universe in terms of being an Earth M designation as opposed to it being milestone and representing on that end. So I'm not sure I'm not sure if that's the intention of the line to kind of tackle those kind of like hot topic issues, if you will. That was definitely seem to be. Um, the, um, the purpose and intent of Milestone um, back in the 90s. I mean, the other thing that you're missing a key part of, and this is why it'll be interesting to see how well it succeed, is how they replace the voice of Dwayne McDuffie. Um, you know, if, if anyone's had the pleasure of watching um, Robert Kirkman's Secret History of Comics, um, I think a Color of Comics, it was episode five, um, a lot of people talked about where Dwayne was coming from. And in many ways, he was a political activist. He was concerned with diversity. He was concerned about representing um, people of color in comics in a way that would advance and forward the conversation. And um, and I think when you start to get a sense of like where he was coming from on that and where Dennis was coming from on, on that, I'm not sure if that's gonna, if this new version of Milestone is gonna have that same, um, that same drive um, to do so. I mean, the opportunity is there. The opportunity is there to tell the kind of stories to kind of move things forward. But um, we'll have to see that that that's um, I think Dwayne had a very specific voice and a very specific vision and what he was doing in his work. And I think not to say that Dennis um, doesn't have the same doesn't have those same things. But I think with Dwayne, it was more it was more on his sleeve. And I think even Dennis will admit to that. that it was more on his sleeve than it was than it was uh, with Dwayne than it was with Dennis. So we'll see. 
I don't know if they can get the whole band back together because everybody's obviously moved on to many different things. Uh, like Matt, Matt Wayne, for instance, was one of the editors I worked under when I worked at Milestone, and he's definitely um, deeply entrenched in the animation world right now. A lot of the guys are just in different places. Um, another guy that I know, um, Jason Medley, who's worked in other uh, comic book projects, I believe he, he's over at Warner Home Video now, and I don't know if they've been approached to be involved with it. But it's just, um, other than maybe bringing Christopher Priest in it, who was one of the original five founders, but he left before they went, um, before mm -hmm. they launched the company. Other than bringing Christopher Priest back in to provide that kind of that kind of voice, I think those are the two big things. Um, how much of it is going to be a DC brand as opposed to something that's independent that can tackle those issues? Because apparently that's kind of what got them into a little trouble with DC in the first place <laughs> was that mm -hmm. Dwayne wanted to tackle some issues that were considered more controversial. Um, that was a whole thing about the static cover and about black sexuality, that that was one of the things that caused the rift between Dennis and Dwayne to begin with. So is Milestone going to have those, that kind of teeth to go after those issues? We'll see, but that that's on them and what they're trying to accomplish with the brand this time around with the line of comics. Yeah, you know, just kind of talking so, about the spirit and the in the history of Milestone Comics is obviously it was it was founded essentially as a black imprint for imprint for black comic fans with black creators mostly mm -hmm. with black superheroes and and they had a very interesting like there was the the Milestone Comics Bible and it had like all the rules mm -hmm. and the history. Like every character had these intricate backstories. So you had a really fleshed out world, you know, even before it was launched. And, you know, you essentially um, you had kind of derivative characters of Superman. I believe it was Icon. I believe mm -hmm. um, Batman was hardware. Spider-Man was static. And then they had kind of a, a Justice League Avengers type team. Uh, Blood Syndicate. Blood yeah, Syndicate. Blood Syndicate. But it was certainly it was a, a comic imprint that was aimed directly to a, a black audience. But it wasn't only embraced by black readers. It, it was certainly embraced by all comic readers. It was beloved. But it was certainly a different take on those styles of characters with a different perspective. Yeah, and I, I think because they they would probably call it more like archetypes as opposed to being derivative. I mean, clearly, um, Icon was their version of Superman, and um, and and Hardware is actually more Iron Man than. Uh, more than Iron Man and Batman, even though he had those tendencies. And then, like, yeah, of course, Static would be, like, basically the Spider-Man archetype, um, that that young teenage superhero. And I think, really, with Blood Syndicate, I think, really, the Justice League of, like, saying it was their Justice League. Um, it was, isn't actually that was a little correct. bit more uh, out there. Yeah, I mean, Shadow Cabinet, Shadow Cabinet actually was more their version of the Justice League in that sense, because that one featured, it was kind of more like a Justice League meets Mission Impossible, where you would have some of the regular characters like Icon and Hardware join this, like, this, this team, the Shadow Cabinet, to go on certain missions and to take, to do certain things based on whether or not their abilities or their personalities of some, some, to some extent. Um, lent themselves to a mission. I mean, Blood Syndicate really was a unique thing. It, it was something that was unto itself. I mean, Ivan Velez Jr., um, who I believe was the, um, the writer, if not from the very beginning, for a large part of the run, um, really created a team book that just wasn't like anything else on the market. Um, I think, if anything, when you look at Blood Syndicate, it really dealt with the most topical issues, um, basically, in the Black, Latino communities, and even to in areas of... Um, Black and Latino sexuality, it, it was um, widely regarded as basically one of the team books, um, best team books on the market. And um, and Ivan was just killing it. He was killing it in terms of the characterizations, the team dynamics, the um, topics that he was addressing. And then when um, Criss Cross came on board, which I think is around maybe the fifth or sixth issue, if I remember correctly, it just took the book to a whole nother level. So I think with Mom, I think with Milestone, they definitely wanted to have their archetypes in there. I think at the same time, they were creating other characters that were wholly original and wholly new. The, my personal favorite is, of course, with Blood Syndicate. Um, Cobalt was another one, which is basically um, almost like this white guy. Almost, I almost want to say that was more of that Batman than anyone else was Cobalt. And um, basically, he had this, this teenage sidekick that was just completely ridiculous and, 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 and inept, which I think was maybe some of that commentary on uh, their dislike for uh, kid, side, kid sidekicks. And then uh, the other one was Zombie, which was a great book that they actually um, apparently are bringing back um, in the relaunches duo. But I think when if you looked at just those three books alone, it's like um, you can see how they have very unique vision and very unique things they want to say. 
But um, yeah, it was it was definitely it was a it was a history. It was a it was a first. It was the first black owned and black operated um, comic book company um, in history that was di- distributed nationwide, and it was it was a big deal. It was like there, and it was like, and the thing is, is that it met the bar that. Um, as I've been doing research for animated concepts and people talk about it, the product was good. The stories were good. Mm-hmm. The art was good. Um, you didn't feel like you had because um, the characters were black or the company was owned by a bunch of black uh, black men. You didn't feel like you were obligated to buy the books because of that. You bought the books because they were good. You, you, you invested in the characters because they were well fleshed out and well thought out. So. I do want to talk to you about Icon because I think the the inspiration, the idea behind that is so interesting. Well, I think mm-hmm. derivative is probably the wrong word. In, inspired yep. by, he's certainly their yep. version of Superman. But whereas Superman, you know, landed in Kansas, was raised by yep. you know a country family, white country family, is, is eventually embraced by society. Uh, Icon uh, arrives on Earth much earlier in, in history, mm-hmm. while slavery is still uh, happening in the United States in the South. But he's an alien. He's he assumes the identity of a black man in the South is, is taken essentially as a slave. So he has a, a much different perspective and he's treated much differently uh, yep. as far as acceptance, acceptance within society than Superman. And I just thought um, that was a very inspirational take for the character to where you could really yep. dive in there with the same power sets, but really look at stories through a different lens. Yeah, no. And, and that's the thing is like when you look at the origin of icon, which I don't think I would be wrong in saying it borrowed a bit from John Byrne's Superman when he really he really relaunched Superman and still with the whole thing of having a matrix that uh, Superman like a matrix pod that Superman arises on Earth and it's just that with Icon when the pod if you will is imprinted upon it's imprinted upon by basically a black female slave and thus we get the version of Icon but I think what was great about Icon was was that it really was a commentary on the whole idea of blacks being a monolith. And that basically you have a black community where you have two very different views. So parent, so definitely Icon is a black conservative. Uh, Rocket would probably be at this point out of the black liberal or maybe the black progressive, really. And basically how the two of those two, how they see the world. And really what I liked about it was, was that neither one um, necessarily had to compromise on their positions but they found a way as a team to compromise to accomplish the things that they wanted to do. Because really Rocket, is, if you really look at Icon in a sense, Rocket is the real hero of the group, which is, um, I remember her first name, Raquel. I think, I want to say her last name was Welch. Uh, I'm sure they'll, com- they'll correct me in the comments, but Raquel, Raquel really was the one who basically gets Icon to take on the heroic identity, to realize that, it was, that as a symbol, you could be a lot more effective than he had been like basically being a behind the scenes businessman. And it's just, and it, and it really, what I really loved about the book was she really played this POV of like how you could make an assumption about somebody because they have a certain amount of political views. Therefore they must think this way about something, this way about something and that way about something. And what was great about Icon was, was that he was always, he wouldn't fall in line like that. He, he, he didn't, he wouldn't, um, he wouldn't be conformed to her box. Like he had his views. He had his definitely conservative views, but it was like more his, his humanity always went out over the day and vice versa with her. With her. I think that's really the beautiful, the, the, that's what makes the book so beautiful. What makes it so timeless is that you have these very two almost um, extreme point of views, political views, and you get a sense of how, how those conversations and how those relationships should happen between those, not only in terms of the black community, but in terms of human beings in general. You know, you can have two different opposing views, but figure out a way to basically do the right thing going forward. So yeah, Icon definitely is um, an archetype inspired by Superman, but it's like what Dwayne and Mark Bright did with that book just made it something original to, to itself. So. It's definitely my it was certainly book. special. And like I mentioned, you worked at Milestone. I, I imagine you met some of the people there. You know, you have a few minutes just to talk about your 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 thoughts about working well, there and your time spent there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I was there. I would, I would estimate that at least anywhere between one to two years. I started off as an editorial intern, and I found about the opportunity actually in the letters page of one of the Icon books where they they put out they were looking for interns. So I called the number the next day. And, uh, and went down to work. I was there for a few months before I went back to school, um, um, school for more full time. And then I got a call from one of the um, guys in the editorial department, Joseph Illich, 
who had said they wanted me to come back and actually start working as an editorial assistant. And of course I jumped on it. And, um, and, and with Milestone, it was like, it was just, for me, it was just a great place to work. And it was a great place to work because you learned your craft. You, you, you were with people, definitely with Dwayne, um, Dennis and Michael, who were more the creative types. And then there was Derek Dingle, who had basically come from the world of um, business. And I would say business journalism, because he worked at both Black Enterprise. And I believe he worked mm -hmm. at Money Magazine as well. And it's like with the four of them, what you had access to was knowledge, knowledge and experience and craft. And everybody in that office. I mean, uh, one of uh, Erica Helene, who was one of the production managers. Um, um, Jason wasn't there at the time, but Adam Blaustein, who was one of the writers, the creatives there. It's like, if you had a question about the business of comics or the craft of comics, if you ask any of them, um, they could write a book for you in terms of that. And so that's what I always appreciate about Milestone was that it was a great place to learn the business of comics and the craft of comics. They were always open to it. You can, um, I remember having at least two or three conversations with Dwayne just about storytelling. And one in particular was after they had treated us all to Star Trek Generations. Uh, they took us out to go see that movie, which, uh, <laughs> You know, if you've seen it, then <laughs> you see why I got the look on my face. But I remember um, we were having pizza afterwards, I believe it was. And I went up to Dwayne. I just asked him. I was just like, you know, I guess I called him. Well, you have to, in comics, you have to call people by their first name. You don't do Mr. McDuffie. So it's like, Dwayne, can you please explain to me why I did not enjoy that movie? And he basically went <laughs> scene by scene, basically laying out why this, the setup, did, because of the setup, they didn't feature these characters. This part didn't make didn't make logical sense. It's like you could do that at any time of milestones. As a matter of fact, I remember times we would just sit around when we just didn't have anything to do, and we would just go back and forth about why stuff did not work from a story perspective, why things did work from a story perspective. Like talking about James Robinson's The Golden Age. We would talk about the business of comics, which is I think I got one of the great principles and the, one of the great um, observations in life came from Erica um, Helene where she says that the reason why you have so many people out there when they're one hit wonders is because they really have no idea why they were successful in the first place. They have no sense of the craft. They've kind of got the sense of how to do something out in the comic book business or the music business or the film industry, but because they don't understand the craft of it, they can't duplicate the success in their sophomore efforts. So it was just a hotbed. And I, and I mean, literally mean that it was a hotbed that if you were paying attention, and you were smart enough to be in that environment to ask the right questions, you could learn. I learned stuff during my time at Milestone, which is over 20 something years ago, that I'm still using today and will be using when we launch Animated Concepts. It, it, was, it was just that great of a place to work. Yeah. Really so was. we know a lot of these uh, people are still with us. Obviously, Dwayne, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, has passed on, but Dennis Cowan's out there. Uh, Christopher Priest is out there. Joseph P. Illich is still out there. I think he's an yep. executive editor somewhere right now. Yeah, heavy metal. You know, so yep. hopefully, some of those uh, some of those talents will maybe be brought back in. But obviously, you know the the industry has changed. There are new people yep. out there. Can you think of any new rising talents that you think or you hope will get a shot at, at Milestone and would really fit in with that brand and, and maybe do some great things within today's current environment? Oh yeah, I think definitely the the first one of anybody is Brian Hill. I believe that's I believe that's his name, the guy who wrote the Killmonger series. So I'm mm -hmm. going through that now. Killmonger was amazing. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I I think I think if he's not involved in it some level, I think everybody's missing the boat missing the boat on that one. If I if it's another guy I have to say because I've enjoyed his work um, over at Darkstone Comics would be um and I'm gonna get his I'm gonna get Kevin's last name wrong, uh, Kevin Grivino uh, Grivino. And forgive me, Kevin, if I mangled your <laughs> last name there. But basically, he was one of the creators of the Underworld series. Um, he's done some work for Marvel. He created um, Blue Marvel uh, uh, for Marvel. And he's done some great st stuff at Dark uh, Darkstone. I just picked up a copy of um, uh, digitally, only because it's not available uh, um, print, of I believe it was the, um, oh, was it the Mighty Adams, I think it was. But those are two on my list. And then there's just guys that I think that they should bring back into the fold. Like I think Mark Bright, who um, Denny O'Neill, whom we just recently lost, um, definitely had coined at one time as being one of the best storytellers in the business. Um, I think there's a lot of those talents if they're, you know, if they are available. Like Eric Battle was a was one of the pencilers who came in a little bit later on to Milestone, who I thought was a great talent. I haven't seen much uh, much anywhere else, but if they were to bring him in, but definitely I would say probably number one on my list 
would um, definitely be Brian Hill if you were talking uh, if you were talking about those creators. I mean Jamal Igle if they can if they um that's the one I was going to mention because one of the best yeah. things about Milestone really was the art and Jamal yep. Igle is um, the wrong Earth. He did the art on the wrong Earth. He actually knocked it out of the oh. park on that one. I think they got to get the the best. Uh, and brightest artists out there. And I'm not a big fan of Jamal Idol personally. I think he, he, he goes off on a lot of tangents, but he's mm -hmm. a talented uh, creator. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. And, and it's like, so if, if I had to say definitely Brian Hill and Jamal Igle, um, Kevin, Kevin, of course. And I think that there are some people from the, from the old group that they would, they should bring back. Well, I mean, you can't get Matt Wayne back. And I love what Matt is doing over in terms of uh, writing the story of the animation. But um, I think Mark Bright, um, at least like you said, if they do like a guest bit or a guest shot to bring him back in, I, I think that would be a good a good catch. And um, and of course you have Joe, who I learned a lot. Uh, Joe Illich, who I learned a lot when I was working at Milestone as well. Um, he was kind enough when he was taking Denny O'Neill's writing class to share um, notes on that writing class with me. But of course he's at Heavy Metal now, so I'm sure they'll get him in for a guest spot or something like that. But uh, Chris Cross, I'm not sure what he's up to these days. I haven't seen a lot from him. I know he was doing some work for DC at one time, but he's also another awesome, awesome storyteller. Um, the stuff that he was doing on uh, Blood Syndicate alone um, is stuff that I still reference to this day in terms of the writer, in terms of how to visually um, lay out a story. So, yeah, it, it's um, that's a good question. I, I have to I have to dig in a little bit more and see of the of the new crew, the new generation. We should be looking like. I mean, they got Ken Lashley. At least he did at least one of the illustrations. He did the Icon Rocket illustration. So that would be good. I hope they get a good anchor for him because I think Ken Lashley. I like his stuff, but I think it, always with him, I think the strongest, the stronger anchor you can get for him, the better. But um, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see who they come up with. And of course, um, I know based on with the old milestone, they're definitely going to bring in um, some new talents that we haven't heard of and we aren't aware of. They're going to surprise us. That's one of the things that when people look at Milestone, they should realize is they broke a lot of new talent. I mean, they broke J.P. Leon. They broke um, Humberto uh, Ramos, um, Chris, Car Chris Cross, of course, um, Ivan Velez Jr., who was a very, talent very talented writer. You had Joe, Joe Illich, who's now serving as executive editor over at um, Heavy Metal. Um, there were a lot of people who have careers and, um, and well-deserved careers in the entertainment industry because of their work at Milestone is because they were taught well. Um, they came in with a lot of knowledge and talent and then it was honed and, um, and it was honed and enhanced during that time of Milestone. And if you look at all those four founders, um, every last one of them, that's always something they're doing. And I, I don't, and even though I haven't interacted with them personally over the last 20 or so years, I know for a fact that um, they came into Milestone discovering and fostering new talent and I'm sure they're gonna, and they and I'm sure they've continued that that tradition in the meantime, and they'll do so with the new with the new imprint. So, yeah, yeah, Brian Hill well, definitely top of the list on that one. <laughs> I'm That's personally amazing. pretty excited about this. You know, definitely want to get some more information. We'll definitely cover it here on the channel, Jervain. I really appreciate all your insight and, and your information regarding time. Milestone and, and the relaunch. And as they say, Milestone forever. That's it is the <laughs> brand. So you know, and the only I'll say this just before we go. The only other thing I would say if I was to give any advice about it is I just I really hope that they really nail it this time with the promotion of the line um, outside of, say, the direct market. I think there are a lot of people who are thirsty for for this kind of content, um, who are looking for heroes um, that look like themselves for a variety of reasons, whether it's not just kids, but also adults who want their kids and, um, and other young people they know to be able to read comics like this. So I'm really hoping DC is gone, much like they're doing things differently with distribution. I'm hoping they're going to do something different in terms of the promotional ad, the promotion aspect when it comes to this line. Um, if nothing else, for the legacy of Milestone, it's worth it. And I wish them all the best. I wish them all the best. So, um, yep, Milestone forever. <laughs>